Hi, it's Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health, and I'm here at Frontiers Health. Joining me right now in the studio, I have Albert Franz. He is a pianist, and he's also someone who's used med tech to find his biological family. So this is such an interesting story, and we got into hearing just a little bit of it, and so I'd love for you to recount it. Um, so tell me, how did you, what did you do? How did you embark upon this journey? Yeah, it's hard to summarize that, but just in, in, in a nutshell, I, I grew up with, with three adopted siblings from Asia, and they always knew they had a different, I mean, different skin color, they looked different, right? So they always knew that they were adopted, and I always knew that I was the child of, of our parents until I wasn't. So I learned at, when I was turning 30 that, 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 that my parents uh, went to a fertility doctor, and that's how I got here. Uh, and how did you find this out? Did you just like randomly do like a 23andMe or like no, how did this come about? <laughs> <laughs> no, at the time I actually I, I found out uh, through uh, through our former neighbors who have known me since I was uh, since I was a baby. Okay. And and yeah, I, it's a little bit controversial. I understand, uh, but it was it was important for me to to, to know. Uh, and and then I just went on a years long search for my own identity and to to fill in the the, the missing pieces and really the missing half. So how did you? Um, I mean, I guess what did you do from like a from like a medical standpoint? I mean, you had mentioned you'd done like DNA tests and things like that. So talk to me a little bit about yeah. that stuff. Yeah, eventually I did DNA testing once it, it started to become widely available. Okay. Because before then. I, I had I had nothing because in my generation I, I just turned turned 44. So in my generation in in the U.S. The, this was the wild west, and in a way it still is because in in the U.S. the industry is completely unregulated. Um, but I didn't have a donor number. I, I did. I, at one point, have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with, with with my mother, and she told me everything that she knew. Namely, she went to a fertility doctor in Philadelphia. And they, you know, they, they were told that, that the donor is a medical doctor. They just say, okay, is this some random guy off the street or, or what is it, right? <laughs> so, and and that's, that's the only information that, that, I, that I had about my biological father and, like, for, for, for years. But then I, I was incredibly lucky. I, I live in Vienna, mm -hmm. and the sister of, of one of my dearest friends... They're, they're both sisters, and they were both adopted, and they grew, they grew up in Minnesota. But well, the, the sister happened to be a lawyer with a philosophy background working for the National Institutes of Health, and she was one of the people behind the Human Genome Project. Okay. And for, for the, the National Institutes of, of Health, like she was the person mm -hmm. For the ethical, legal, and social implications of genetics. Okay. So she was the specialist for the U.S. So government. So what did she? How, like, how and did she impact her story well, here? Well, yeah. Well, she was. Uh, well, I knew we, we, we would celebrate Christmas t together because she would often come mm -hmm. over to, to Vienna, and she's she's like, you know, Albert, you need to do a DNA test. There's you know there's this new technology. Uh, millions of people have now done done these tests, and it's probably the best way, or maybe even your only hope of finding out more information. So I did this several years ago, and the I I did not get a match right away. I only had you know relatively distant. Uh, cousins, maybe maybe third cousins, fourth cousins, okay. whatever, and and that was too little information to, to to go off of. But then I did find out through DNA testing. I was 40 years old, living in Austria, and then I discovered, okay, I'm Jewish, sure, right, or half Jewish, uh, and and then you know, kind of really shook up my whole sense of identity, and then, you know, it was a real identity crisis. Sure, because, sure. It, because, you know, if, if you're orthodox, then, well, it has to be your mother's half, and whatever, so what am I? So, so it was, I, it was, it, well, it, 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 shook, it shook up my whole sense of identity, especially growing up in America in a multiracial family. Right. The, the, I, I thought in, in my generation, uh, you know, we're they're pretty sensitive to, to racism in general, and if you grow up in a, in a multiracial family, then all the more so, because you, you notice the little things. Sure, sure, right? of course. Um, and, and then to discover, okay, well, I have these two halves of, of me, Right, and what what does this mean? What does it mean living in Austria, right? Given the the, the history, the not too distant history of, of the country and, yeah. and anti-Semitism. Uh, so, but but I had very little information 
to, to go off of. Mm -hmm. So I did more DNA testing. I, I, there, it was actually this whole journey that took years. If, if, if you And so how ultimately did you end up finding your father? Oh, I, through another DNA test. Okay. Incredibly, uh, he took he took an ancestry test. Oh, right? okay. I had tested okay. with other platforms, mm -hmm. but not not ancestry. Uh, and and there's, there's a really funny story. They, they, I forgot to mention this in my in my talk. They, I, I thought, well, maybe he he knows that he was a sperm donor all those years ago. Maybe he was a med student and. And maybe he's curious, and that's why he took the test. And that turned out to be not the case at all. Oh. The, the, actually, what, what happened was his wife gave him a DNA testing kit as a little birthday present. Oh, no and I thought, I was like, wait, I, I, it could have been, could have been like a new sweater. It could have been a coffee yeah. maker. No, you know? and instead and it was you. No, it's, it's like, you, know, it's, you have a son. You have you a long lost son. Right? No, that's great. I mean, I think, I mean, gosh, I mean, as you're trying to, you know, talk through the story and talk about the, the personal questions that it raised for you, I think that's, that's so fascinating. And it's like, you're almost still kind of grappling with it. And so oh, yeah, ultimately yeah. you, you have come to meet this man yes. who is your dad. And yes. so that's happy reunion or? Un unbelievably, and, and I have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm unbelievably fortunate. So, so I'm by no means the, the first donor conceived person to, to find genetic family uh, through, through DNA testing. I, and, and there's a whole spectrum of, of responses because of the industry practice. The, the, so so some, some of the donors say, well, no, it was just a transaction. I signed a confidentiality yeah. agreement. I want nothing to do with any children. Right, and and then, and then the the, the, the people are heartbroken, and and it's understandable. Sure. It's, it's completely understandable. Uh, my the the, re, the reaction that I got from from my new family, has been just an incredibly warm, open reception from oh, everybody, fantastic. from everybody, and, and not just from from my father and and his wife, but but from their they have two kids, and also from extended family. So it's been it's been just incredible. So I'm actually flying to Philadelphia this weekend. Oh, fantastic. Uh, to, you know, <laughs> That's I'll, great. I'll spend Thanksgiving That's with That's awesome. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, because I think, I mean, we have a lot of um, people who are obviously in the healthcare industry who are, who are mm -hmm. watching. And, you know, you, um, one of the things that this brings up is the question of kind of like the medical ethics around it. Oh, yeah. I mean, because yeah. it's, it's interesting. Like, I mean, we think, you know, like so much, at, at so many different steps of the way along your journey, mm -hmm. I mean, from, from your father being a sperm donor and, you know, how you articulated that experience in the clinic, all the way to you and doing the mm -hmm. DNA testing and, and being able to utilize you know, not only one, but multiple different tests, including mm -hmm. the one provided by Ancestry that ultimately united you. So, I mean, as you're, as someone who's kind of experienced all of this, like, what, how do you feel about this from, like, an ethical standpoint? I mean, like, what are, what are your, your takeaways or what are the things that you would want people who are working in this industry to, to understand about your experience? Well, in, in this particular case, I, I really strongly, strongly feel that identity must be recognized as a human right and actually is a human right that's protected by the United Nations. I, I, I spoke there in Geneva last week uh, on, on on medical ethics, right, and, and the ethics in, in this in this practice. So it is actually protected under the UN's Convention for the Rights of the Child, sure. which was uh, which was uh, signed in 1989, and it's been ratified by every country in the world except the United States. So so the U.S. really needs to to catch up on on that. But but in it, the the right to a child to his or her own identity is actually recognized. And then the problem is, the, is, is that, you know, that there are legal loopholes so that, that different countries can, can define the term parent however they wish. So, so there's this trend in, in law now to redefine parent as a purely social construct rather than a biological construct. Mm -hmm. and, and that's seen rightly as justice for the LGBT community. Uh, but, I think we've, we need to, to, to recognize that some of us, like in my case, I have three parents. My adopted siblings, they effectively have four parents, two biological parents, two, two parents raising them. And I think nature and nurture need to be honored. So, so if, if creating a justice for one group simultaneously creates injustice for another group, then I think that's not true justice. Sure. I think it's interesting because, I mean, like, oftentimes, I mean, we talk, we talk to a lot of um, healthcare innovators, you know, in all aspects, not just genomics, mm. but, I mean, across the board. And it's, it's, it's an interesting, um, it's interesting to think about the, like, the greater implications, you know, in terms mm. of, of not only the ethics, but also, you know, like, the, the social, the socioeconomic impact of, like, what you're, what we're creating here when we start mm. to kind of talk about different types of health technology. So I guess if you had um, a piece of advice 
sense for like somebody who's doing like just different types of technology or um, in the healthcare space, whether it be in genomics or if it's in, like gene editing. I mean, there's so many different things that oh, yeah. are going on. I mean, what would your piece of advice be for these innovators and these researchers who are working in this space as somebody who's kind of, you know, lived the, the, the journey of what it's like, you know, all along in your, in your life here, especially as an adult? Wow, that's, that's a big question. Yeah, <laughs> so, what's your advice? Lot, I, 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 so many things just came like flooding into my mind. <gasps> Tell me. That. But, but at least one is, is, that, is that technology has consequences. And, and, and the humans behind, like we, the people who are creating technology are responsible for, are, are, are morally responsible for the consequences of, of that technology. And there are you know, tons of examples through, throughout, throughout history uh, of, of this. But, but that's, that, that's one big thing that, that, that comes to mind. And, but, but then also, uh, technology, like I, I'm, I'm, I've become an activist for, for identity as, as a human right. There, yeah. there are several of us now in the, in the community, so we're a very small community. Uh, and and so some people are getting the courage to, to speak out, and those who have have also encouraged me to, to, to do so. So I'm very grateful, and it, it collectively, you know, hopefully, we could slowly effect uh, some some legal changes around the world. But technology actually uh, can 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 overcome legal injustices. In, in this sense, so so now that DNA testing is is becoming ubiquitous, mm -hmm. the, we don't in one sense we don't need for, to wait for laws to catch up. So it will be possible to, to for people to find their identities and to find a missing family, even if the law says that, that they can't. Yeah. I think that's so, I mean, that's so interesting. And your story is just such a, like, an interesting, like, microcosm of how, like, I don't know, like, health technology has just affected you, like, all, mm. all your whole life long. I think that's really incredible. Thank you so much for sharing with us and for weighing in on that and the morality and the ethical kind of side of things. I really appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> this is Jessica Damasa with WTF Health. Albert, thank you so much for joining us um, at Frontiers Health. Thanks for watching.